Hello, good morning everyone. Welcome to the 98th Learn with Lorna. I'll just wait for a second before getting started. Good morning, John. So welcome to this week's Learn with Lorna, the 98th in the series. Uh, my name is Lorna Steele McGinn, I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service. The Highland Archive Service has four centres across the Highlands of Scotland that house historic documents that tell the story of this part of the world. So we have the Highland Archive Centre in Inverness, we have um, Nucleus Nuclear and Caithness Archives in Wick, Sky Loch Alsha Archive Centre in Portree, and Loch Aber Archive Centre in Fort William. This series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in the Learn with Lorna series of talks. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then we're very grateful for that. Uh, it's nice seeing all your hellos coming in. It's always one of my favourite parts of my week, seeing everybody's uh, hellos coming in and messages and speaking to each other and speaking to me. Um, Thank you for all your uh, lovely comments today and, and uh, through the week we've had some uh, some big posts going out on our, our Facebook pages about uh, upcoming events and um, the, the recording of the STV news about the series and things so it's been really nice seeing your comments coming in so thank you for that and if you haven't come across that I'll come back to that at the end of this talk. So this week we are continuing our February theme of love archives looking at the subject of love and romance in the archives as well as things that we love in our collections and things that we love about our jobs. Um, so I really hope you're enjoying that across all four of our centre Facebook pages. I know there's been some really interesting things that different members of staff had put up about uh, their favourite collections and so on. So I hope you're enjoying that. This week I'm going to look at something a little bit different around the theme of love and romance. Looking at the subject of romanticising. So the way that in which a certain image has come to dominate the perception of the Highlands and also to a large extent the, the, the image of Scotland around the world. How did that happen? Um, where did it come from? Well, I wanted to start by sharing with you an extract from the uh, Kilmally statistical account, the first statistical account in 1793, because I think this will be something that sounds very familiar to you. The, the flowery language aside, the content I think will be very familiar to many of you. So this is describing part of the parish of Kilmally. The high hills on each side of the lakes and rivers mentioned above, opening like huge walls or ramparts on each hand, yield a curious variety of agreeable wild prospects. The vast windings make several turnings of the mountains. They rather diversify the scene. Their extremities declining gradually from their several summits open into valleys where one has variegated views of woods, rivers, plains and lakes. The torrents of water which here and there tumble down precipices and in many places break, break through the cracks and cliffs of the rock, arrest the eye and suspend the mind in awful astonishment. In a word, the number, the extent and the variety of these prospects the irregular wildness of the hills, of the rocks and the precipices, the noise of the rivulets and torrents breaking and foaming among the stones in such diversity of shape and colour, the shining smoothness of the seas and the lakes, the rapidity and rumbling of the rivers falling from shelf to shelf and forcing their streams through a multitude of obstructions, the serenity of azure skies and splendour of the glorious sun riding in the brightness of his majesty, have something so charmingly wild and romantic and so congenial to the contemplative mind as surpasses all description and presents a scene of which the most fervid imagination can scarcely form an idea. The traveller who is so callous as to behold all this and not feel the greatness and majesty of almighty architect impressed upon his heart must be indeed strangely void of sense, of taste and of sentiment. So, as I say, very, very sort of flowery and descriptive language. Um, and if you're tuning in for the first time, I, I promise I don't always talk in such a, a exotic language. Um, but that that description is absolutely typical of the way people perceive the Highland landscape. So 
there's that the the use of the words wild and romantic and the torrents of water the mountains the precipices the hills um lochs and stones and all of that is absolutely central to the image that many people have of the highlands but alongside that and please do correct me if i'm wrong and it will be interesting to see what the perceptions are from different places in the world and in the highlands um Alongside that, there's probably also an association that you have in your mind with tartan, with clans, with bagpipes, um, Highland Games, and a number of other things that come to your mind when you picture uh, the Highlands and when you picture Scotland. So where did that image come from? And how, how does it represent real life in the Highlands? And did it ever represent real life in the Highlands? Well, there's several things that we need to cover. Um, if we start by looking at the Romantic movement, what is the Romantic movement? Well, it was, a, it was a, a movement that swept across Europe in the late 1700s and the 1800s. And it generated literature and artwork and architecture and uh, poetry and so on. And various European countries were swept up in this, this wave of romanticism, which was to some extent a move away from the previous tradition, which had been the previous kind of big era had been the age of enlightenment. And that had been characterised by a pursuit of knowledge, of scientific reasoning and so on. So uh, a very different feel. Romanticism focused much more on the imagination, the connection between people and the landscape and nature and using that connection to generate creative uh, artwork or writing. Now, there were several Scots who were hugely influential in the shaping of the Romantic movement and several people who uh, also had an influence on it. And I'm exactly seeing uh, the names coming up, Queen Victoria, Sir Walter Scott, absolutely. So let's talk about some of the people who shaped that romantic movement in Scotland. I'm gonna start with James Macpherson. James Macpherson was born in 1736 in Ruthven, just near King Ucy. And he went away, studied in Aberdeen and lived temporarily in Edinburgh, but came back to home to work as a school teacher and a poet. And in the mid, mid 1700s, Macpherson claimed that he had been given sight of a wealth of ancient Gallic poetry and writings. And he, he said that he had been able to see, to see these, these ancient pieces of Gallic writing, including original Gallic epic poetry composed by the third century uh, poet Ossian. Now, James claimed, uh, James Macpherson claimed that he had seen the originals of Ossian's work and he set about translating them and publishing them in a number of volumes and he got some uh, patronage for this, he got some support, he was given some uh, funding that enabled him to travel around the highlands and islands collecting and adding to this. Now in our Baron collection which I spoke about last week, um, the Baron family collection, there's an account of how James Macpherson might have obtained these original documents. And it uh, is a, a summary of, of him, of how he might have obtained them written like this. A member of the Highland Society of London gives the following account of certain circumstances which enabled Mr Macpherson to procure so great a collection of Gallic poetry. When Mr Macpherson was a tutor in the family of Mr Graham of Balgowan, he got acquainted with a neighbouring clergyman, Mr Fraser, then Minister of Retgorton, but now settled in the vicinity of Perth, whose grandfather and great-grandfather was successively deans of the Isles. Being much addicted to literary pursuits, they had made a variety of collections in different languages, but in particular Gallic literature. Great parts of these collections were carried away by Dr James Fraser, Register and, Je and Secretary to Chelsea College during the reigns of Charles II, James II, William, Anne and George I, who was nephew to the youngest Dean. But the Gallic manuscripts remained in the possession of Dean's, the Dean's eldest son, Mr Thomas Fraser, Minister of Boleskine in the county of Inverness. When Mr Macpherson took his northern tour for the purpose of collecting Gallic poetry, which he afterwards translated and published, he was introduced by Fraser of, of Redgorton to Mr Fraser of Boleskine, then in the 87th year of his age, and he prevailed upon him to deliver up these manuscript collections 
Now, the fact that that document exists at all of someone explaining how Macpherson might have got hold of the Ossian uh, originals, the fact that that exists at all illustrates the fact that there was immediately controversy. As soon as these started to be published, there was controversy about whether James Macpherson could possibly have discovered these ancient writings of Ossian from the third century, or if in fact he had just written them himself and was using the name of Ossian to um, create a certain impression of them. And so loads of different people ask to see the original manuscripts. If you've got these original Ossian manuscripts, then we want to see them. And that could be proof. Um, before they would believe that he hadn't uh, written them himself. And there was a huge debate about it. It was incredibly widespread and very, very high profile. And uh, James McPherson pretty much constantly said, I don't have to, basically, I don't have to justify myself to you. I, I've, you can just take it on my word. And what's interesting about this is the controversy raged for decades. And, and to some extent is, is still ongoing. But it was perhaps at its height in the 1770s and 1780s when people such as Samuel Johnson, the famous uh, dictionary writer, strongly denied the fact that these could possibly be Ossian originals. Books were written about the authenticity of the works and in the end uh, there was a committee set up, the Highland Society of Scotland, who had a, they had a remit to preserve Highland culture and tradition and co uh, collect ma Gaelic manuscripts. And they set up a committee to inquire into the original uh, source of the poems after Macpherson's death because he died without revealing them. And the inquiry in 1805 found that the poems were not forged, but it was likely that the original oral and written material, there had been some original material and Macpherson had significantly altered it. Now, the reason I've kind of gone into that, that story is that while all that was swirling around and there was controversy about it and there was talk about it, what was definitely happening was that James Macpherson's works were becoming incredibly popular. Now, his writings and, and poems which uh, described landscape of the Highlands and Islands, heroic ancient figures such as Ossian, such as uh, Finn McCool, battles, um, obviously Finn McCool, I will jump straight in and say that's uh, Irish, um, so he described all these ancient characters, landscapes, um, the mist, the environment of the Highlands and Islands, battles and romances. And these were translated into numerous languages and they made Macpherson an internationally famous writer, especially across Europe. Um, his works were read by uh, and influenced people like Goethe and Voltaire and Napoleon. Um, we, we even have a letter in our collections, in our Fraser Teitler um, collection, a letter from Henry Holm saying how he had written to Macpherson to offer him some advice. Now, we also have to see this in context. Macpherson was publishing these poems only about 15, 20 years after the Battle of Culloden had led to the Disarming Act and the banning of Highland Dress. The, the dismantling of that already fracturing clan system is the backdrop against which Macpherson was writing these poets. So there was already a whole range of emotions and opinions and resentments and questions around identity swirling around the country and in particular swirling around the Highlands. The Jacobite period again is something which has become very, very romanticised as time has gone by. So something at the time Macpherson was publishing these poems, harking back to an ancient Scotland, something had not long happened, which had been basically a line in the sand um, between the old and the new of Scotland. So perhaps, in, in my opinion, perhaps there was an, an inevitable pull to look backwards at that point, because Highland culture at that point was being dismantled, their identity was being challenged, as I say, Jacobite, the Jacobite period is something which has become very romanticised and people have a, a very particular image of it in their head, I think. And I wanted to share with you an extract which maybe is a little bit surprising and it's, it's only one of them. There are many, many documents like this in the Barron collection. Evan MacLeod Barron, who I spoke about last week, um, was a historian and writer. 
And he wrote a lot about the Jacobite period and the fact that um, the romanticism which had been associated with it was all a myth. And that actually it wasn't a very glorious period in, in our history. And this is um, a summary of something he had written. Romance and reality. Scots have been so accustomed to regard the doings of Prince Charles Edward and the Jacobites as, constitu as constituting one of their most romantic periods in their history, that it will be a shock to many to find a historian such as Mr. Evan Barron of Inverness declaring that he finds in Jacobitism nothing especially noble or praiseworthy. Popular history books have thrown a glamour of romance over the Jacobite adventures, but dispassionate inquiry, and that is the true function of the historian, shows another side to the targe. Certainly there were ongoings in the Scottish army during the months preceding Culloden that no Scot can contemplate with pride. Mr Barron tells us that we ought to admire the Highlanders who had the sense and courage not to be Jacobites, but history has little to say of those who simply stayed at home and do nothing. Negative virtues make a poor chronicle, but given a handsome prince and devoted Highlanders, there is no telling how far the imagination may travel into the realms of fantasy. So you can see there quite, um, quite an incendiary thing at the time it was written and, and he put his arguments across and we have his speech that he wrote about that called the Jacobite myth. And then some of the feedback he got on both sides of that uh, debate. But you can see again there those words of this is a romantic adventuring time, um, the realms of fantasy. So Macpherson's poets lo poems looking back to an older Scotland are set all amongst this backdrop. So Macpherson played a huge part in the romanticising of Scotland and so did the Jacobite movement. But so too did Robbie Burns, um, who again went around collecting, much like Macpherson went around collecting and gathering old folk tales and folk songs using both English and Scots to deliberate effect to reach a wider audience. Now, one of the other big names uh, that has to be mentioned here, absolutely central to this movement, and we've already seen people commenting about him, is Sir Walter Scott. Right at the centre of the Romantic movement and absolutely key to the image of Scotland and the Highlands that has dominated from the 1800s through to today. And that's both a good thing and a bad thing. We'll come back to that. Now, Walter Scott was not a Highlander, uh, although I think he had uh, Highland roots somewhere in his family, but his family were from the borders and he spent much of his life going between the borders and, and Edinburgh. He went to Edinburgh University before becoming an advocate and then Sheriff Depute of Selkirkshire. But again, like Macpherson and like Burns, he spent time travelling the country, looking for inspiration for his writings and harking back to the stories of centuries before. Scott is said to have been the person who invented the historical novel. He took historical fact, and of course, fact in itself is something that is not a static concept. Fact um, depends on, on politics, it depends on context, it depends on viewpoints, so many things. But he took what was understood to be historic fact and added in imagined dialogue. And that was the first time really that that had been done. And this blending of fact and fiction, what could or couldn't be proved about the past in Scotland, echoes what Macpherson had done with Ossian. There's a, a, a blurring of the lines between fact and fiction. And like Macpherson and Burns, Scott's work was incredibly popular. And people across the world started to picture Scotland the Scotland that Scott had created rather than the Scotland that really existed. And Scott himself said, there's nothing so easy to invent as a tradition. It's an interesting phrase and I think it's, it's quite a dangerous phrase, um, quite problematic, I think. There's nothing so easy to invent as a tradition. Now, it was Scott's popularity of his writings and also his reputation for creating that image that led to him in August 1822, 200 years ago this year, being given the job of stage managing the visit of King George IV to Edinburgh. Now, this was a significant visit 
of a monarch. The first visit of a monarch to Scotland in nearly 200 years. Charles II had been the last person to visit uh, in 1651. Also the first, therefore, the first visit of a monarch since those Jacobite uprisings. Since those risings had brought the House of Stuart into conflict with the House of Hanover and of course catastrophic result for the House of Stuart with the House of Hanover becoming uh, the triumphant house. And so we've had kind of collating all those things I've said, we've had a, a nation that's kind of been torn apart um, with people split on both sides, families split on both sides. The result of that has been that some of its culture has been dismantled and taken apart. Then we've had the layering on that of Macpherson and Scott linking very much the image of Scotland to the distant past and not to the present or the future. And now we're at the point where only 60 years after the Battle of Culloden, a comparatively short time when you think about it, we have a member of that successful side of that um, Hanoverian family coming to visit Scotland. And so that's the situation in which Scott is given the role of setting the stage to welcome this Hanoverian monarch into Scotland. Now, Scott has been given over the years a lot of bad press for this um, because the visit was very staged and it was staged to create an effect and an image of Scotland. He wrote a letter to MacLeod of MacLeod at the time saying, do come and bring half a dozen or half a score of clansmen so as to look like the island chief that you are. Highlanders are what he will best like to see, and the masquerade of the Celtic society will not do without some of the real stuff to bear it out. Pray come, and don't forget to bring the bodyguard for the credit of old Scotland and your own old house. And MacLeod of MacLeod did uh, just that, and so did uh, and numerous others. The streets for the visit were lined with Highlanders dressed in tartan, something that would have been absolutely inconceivable just a few years earlier. And the visit was a huge success. Um, well, it depends on your viewpoint, I suppose, but it's a, a huge success in that the monarch was utterly impressed by it. Now, the visit wasn't natural. It was curated, and you can see that in that letter to MacLeod and MacLeod saying, bring people with you, bring clansmen to make it look a certain way. So the look was curated. And the use of Highlanders to represent an image of all of Scotland, which didn't accurately reflect, reflect the current state of affairs in the Highlands, and didn't really reflect the rest of Scotland much at all, it was a throwback to an idealised Scotland. And it's from that image, from that event more than anything else, that we have the image of kilted Highlanders, of tartan, uh, etc. And that at that point began really to be associated with Scotland's image across the world. Was it damaging or was it a good thing? Well, for the last 200 years, there have been strong, strong opinions on both sides of that debate. Some people say that this compounded that idealised version of the Highlands that, also, that Macpherson uh, and so on had been creating. And it almost froze Scotland in time by not allowing the contemporary Scotland to be shown at that point. But others, such as Evan Barron, believe that the Highlands owed Scott a huge debt for making the area centre stage and for bringing it to the world's attention. And this is what um, Evan Barron wrote about that particular event that Scott managed. The charge is made against him that he did the Highlands considerable harm by romanticising them to excess. But is that charge true? Is it not rather the case that we, the Highlanders ourselves, are largely to blame for the false romanticism which has obscured so much of the reality of Highland life and history? Scott, at all events, did the Highlands signal service. Remember that down to the time when the Lady of the Lake appeared, one of Scott's pieces of work, the Highlands were practically unknown. Communications were scanty and difficult and travellers were therefore few, and only an insignificant percentage even of lowland Scots had ever set foot in the Highlands. Nor had the day of the appreciation of Highland scenery yet dawned. To the mass of our fellow countrymen in the South, the Highlands were a grim, for forbidding and desolate part of the country, inhabited mainly by people who spoke a strange speech and whose manners and customs were still suspect. 
Scott altered all that. He revealed the beauty and grandeur of the Highlands. He gave to the lowlander, the Englishman and the foreigner a new and favourable idea of the Highland people. What matter if he sometimes over-romanticised us? Better that than the old idea that we were a proud, quarrelsome, poverty-stricken lot among whom douse lowlanders had to walk wearily. Taken all in all, therefore, the debt which the Highlands owe to Scott is immense and we should be ungrateful indeed if we did not acknowledge it. And Scotland has been, has remained with that image that Scott created to some extent ever since. Guidebooks ever since the, that time have spoken about the wild and romantic Highlands. One in our collections even says uh, that the Highlands was an unknown land until Scott wrote about it, which, you know, that really depends on your perspective. It certainly wasn't unknown to the people who had lived there for centuries. Uh, it's all a it's all a question of what you see as central and what you see as remote. But so guidebooks continued to perpetuate that wild and romantic image. The popularity of tartan and Highland games and so on exploded as a result of that work of Scott. And I wanted to share with you some a couple of extracts about tartan. We hold at the Highland Archive Centre the collection of James Scarlett, who is a world authority on tartan. He was a designer of tartan and a writer of many, many books on the subjects. And he was did a huge amount of extensive academic research about the subject. And he had this to say about the subject of tartan. Tartan is a complex and emotive subject which has over the years gathered to itself an enormous mythology that has become accepted as immutable truth by a confused and largely wishful thinking public. Romanticism, the readiness of the Victorian antiquarians to use preconceived ideas as launching pads from which to jump to extraordinary conclusions and sheer commercialism, together with very few facts, all contributed to the making of these myths, which, by constant repetition, paraphrasing and interpretation, have taken on the appearance of universal knowledge so that nobody thinks to question them. There's no harm in a myth in its proper place. And the myth that all Scots from the beginning of time could be identified by their tartans is a nice friendly myth, but one for which there is no recorded foundation. He goes on to say that the, the matter of fact is that there is no record of clan tartans in the, mo in the modern sense being in common use before the 45 rising. And that such documentary information as has come down to us is indefinite in its meaning. So he goes on to say clan tartans in the modern sense didn't make an, an appearance until late in the 18th century and um, that it was certainly not something that was commonly used. He says in 1822 the king, the king George IV made his celebrated visit to Edinburgh, the first crowned monarch to visit the capital of Scotland since Charles. Stage managed by Sir Walter Scott and General Stuart of Garth, the royal visit extravaganza may truly be said to have laid the foundations of the clan tartan system. Chiefs turned out in full regalia with all their retinues, all in their clan tartans. The king himself appeared in Highland dress, and it is said in pink tights, to hide the royal knees from the vulgar gaze of the subjects. One or two tartans chosen from the pattern books became clan tartans at about this time, and one is left with the feeling that astute merchants may well have been able to foist off something that was not selling well as somebody's true and ancient tartan. The result of all of this was that the Highlanders were suddenly rehabilitated. Less than a century before, they had been Sauvage des Cos and our northern barbarians, but now every Highland frog was an enchanted prince. The clan system got good publicity and a clan connection began to be perceived as something like a link with the nobility. The clan tartan was a visible link, a sign of that link. Though the time was not yet ripe, it was soon to come to pass that everybody who was anybody, or more accurately, anybody who aspired to be somebody, had to have a tartan. And this led directly to those what is your tartan lists that hang outside the shops of tourist centres during our summers. It also led to prosperity for tartan manufacturers. So yes, the Highlanders wore and continue to wear kilts and tartan but perhaps the reality of how that came about has been somewhat skewed and mythologized. 
The last thing I wanted to touch on was one of those other very Highland images, the Highland Games. That image of the strong men tossing the caber or the hammer and Highland dancers demonstrating their skill in, uh, in a range of coloured tartans. Well, we hold a number of Highland Games collections across our centres and they shed a bit of light on this subject. Although there may well be ancient roots to this subject, and it's the same with many of these things, there will be roots of truth in things uh, going way back. Likely, probably the Highland Games likely to be connected with some kind of military training or uh, strengthening body conditioning to some extent. The, the modern Highland Games date largely from the same period. So they come in really in 1700s and 1800s, same time as that post culloden McPherson scott wave of uh, of highland type things highland games were sometimes orchestrated by the landowners again managing an image of what the highlands should be with the highlands highlanders as the centerpiece of this creating a highland tradition while excluding some aspects of highland culture which were equally part of the highlanders reality so there was sometimes a disconnect between the people organising and again, kind of stage managing these things and distributing the prizes associated with it. A disconnect between them and the people who were encouraged to take part. In the Sky Highland Games, there were specific cont contests that natives were allowed to enter. So it would say in brackets after it, natives can enter this competition. And the collection also includes, that we hold in our Sky and Locality Archive Centre, also includes photos of tourists posing with the natives, and that's how it's captioned. So there sometimes is an imbalance between the way people perceive the Highlands and the people of the Highlands and the way that we perceive ourselves. And often throughout time, that image has been not curated with complete buy-in by the people of the Highlands. But, and it's really important note to finish on, that we are equally a part of creating that image. We are, um, I don't know if I want to say guilty, I don't know if it is a guilt, but we are certainly um, responsible for capitalising on that image of the Highlands and perpetuating it. We hold in our collections uh, at Hark an exhibition guidebook from a 1930 uh, Highland exhibition that was held in Inverness Town Hall. And it's entitled The Story of, uh, of the History, the Antiquities, the Folk Life, Arts and Crafts and the Romance of the Highlands and Islands. That book, written by people in the Highlands, describes the, ja the Jacobite Rising of, of 1745 as a romantic campaign from the audacious coming of the prince to his brief triumph to his final defeat at Culloden and his lonely wanderings as a fugitive. It describes the part on clothing by saying the Highlander always took such proper pride in his appearance and says that the tartans in the exhibition represented to the people a great deal more than merely pieces of pretty stuff. It was characteristic of the very fabric that the Highlandman wore that they should be designed to express his pride in his clan. So you can see how even in the Highlands, our our awareness of our own story is, is muddled and, and we perpetuate that as well. So there's absolutely no doubt that through the ages, we have in turn resented and embraced that image of the Highlands that's portrayed to the world. And we have absolutely played a part in that ourselves, as well as people out with the Highlands have, have, have laid it onto us. Now, another thing that's really key just to, to finish up with is Scholarship and academic research on Ossian, on Macpherson, on Scott, on Tartan, on uh, romanticisation, all of that comes in waves and it comes from different perspectives. We all bring our own perspective when we talk about subjects like this. We all bring our own passions and opinions about it and it's constantly being questioned. There are still people discussing whether Macpherson wrote those poems himself or whether he didn't. Still people discussing whether Scott created a fake image of Scotland or whether he gave Scotland, put Scotland on the world stage. All of those things are still constantly being addressed in academic research and in the vernacular as well in conversation with people.
But the main thing to remember, I think, if there's if you take anything away from this, and again, if you're in the Highlands and you have an opinion on this, please do share because I, I certainly don't have a, a, a set view on on any of this. But one of the main things to remember, I think, my takeaway from it is that while all of those things, while Highland Games and Tartan and clans and all of those things are now intrinsically linked to the Highlands and the image of Scotland, it's just important to remember that there's much more to us, the people, the places, than all of that. We're more that, we certainly are that, but we're also more than that. And I wanted to finish by reading just a short extract from one of those early guidebooks. And it says, the tourist, Hurriedly, hurriedly following the prescribed route from one attraction to the next, does not see the Highlands or the Highlanders as they really are. To do that, he must drop into our more leisurely way of life, spend some time in our villages and stop between viewpoints to look at the landscape, to really look at the landscape. Ours is not a land of intensive farming or mass production of nuts and bolts. It is one where the ties of blood, home and friendship are still strong, where there is time to know one's neighbours and to stop for a chat. Perhaps the spirit of the clans is still abroad. I hope that you've enjoyed that. It was I found it a very challenging one to write um, because, as I say, it's something people feel very, very strongly about one way or the other. And I know that that image of the Highlands is something that's very precious to a lot of people as well. So. Um, I hope you found that interesting uh, and uh, useful. I hope you can join me next week. Next week, I will be looking at the Davidson Collection, which is a collection held in Nucleus, the Nuclear and Caithness Archives, that has an interesting uh, love story in it. I hope you can join me for that. I hope you can join me on the 8th of March for my interview with Professor Dame Sue Black, which I advertised yesterday. She is an absolute hero of mine, and I was beyond delighted to meet her and to report that she is as wonderful as I expected. So I hope you can join me for that interview with uh, Sue Black. Uh, I'm hoping to post up the interview with STV over the next couple of days. We had an interview with STV News about the 100th uh, episode of Learn with Lorna that is coming up in a couple of weeks. So I hope you can see that as well. I'm now going to stop talking and remind you that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. But High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then we're very grateful for that. And thank you so much to uh, everyone who is commenting and saying that they've enjoyed the talk today. I'm very glad. Thank you. <laughs>